questions and you want answers. Welcome to the Q&A show. Okay, good evening. It is Thursday evening and it is live. If you have any questions about the Bible, this is the program, really, that you need to take part with. And in that, you can do through live at revelationtv.com or through the text numbers and things that come on your screen. Tonight's special guest, uh, who's going to be sitting in the hot seat, as it were, is Pastor Derek Walker from Oxford Bible Church. I want to welcome you to the program, Pastor Derek. Good to have you back. Thank you, Howard. Good to be here. That's a good-looking picture for Skype. Well oh. done. <laughs> Excellent. Love modern technology. Soon it will be catching up uh, to where we'll have total quality broadcast mm. uh, signals coming through Skype. Thank you Thanks. very much indeed for those of you out there who are the nerds and geeks of this world and yeah. can bring us uh, the means in which to broadcast, especially on budget television like uh, Christian television. Uh, but Revelation TV is making as much uh, you know, of this situation as we can with regards to the technology that's out there. By the way, Pastor Derek, we're in 169 countries currently through our internet, so we welcome those who watch us uh, through our internet streaming. And also for those who want to get on our website, www.revelationtv.com, and you can have uh, what is called catch-up TV for all, uh, mostly all the live shows. So get yourself on that uh, website and uh, let yourself be blessed. Uh, in the future, if you're missing pit parts of programs uh, or you want others uh, that you know to really benefit from the programs that we have, please do point them to that website. Now, coming back to tonight, uh, Pastor Derek, you, you've written a book, uh, another one, yet another one, The Keys of Time. Uh, maybe you could just tell us a little bit about this, and then uh, with the questions that are going to come in, let me just say, point them in the direction of eschatology, end times, what, uh, the times which of the Gentiles, when they come to an end, Jesus said that he would come back again. There's all sorts of scriptures mentioned in Matthew 24, uh, Luke 21, Mark 13, and of course there's all the other Gospels, and including the, the prophets of old, they all uh, sort of run in tandem with each other. Don't ever listen to the people who say the Old Testament is past and gone, we don't need to take any notice of it because uh, they'll be missing out on uh, the benefit there. Talking about the Old Testament, before you go on to your book, what would you say is really important about, uh, for Christians to read the, the Old Testament? Because even Margaret Thatcher apparently had just started reading at the end of her life and being a staunch uh, yeah, believer in Jesus Christ, she, she only just in her latter months uh, read the Old Testament. Really? Yeah. Wow. Of course, the Old Testament um, is vital because it's the whole, the whole word. Of, we need the whole word of God. And really, you can't understand the New Testament um, without the Old Testament. You know, the, in a sense, the New Testament assumes that we know the Old Testament. And so the New Testament will make just a reference, say, to the Lamb of God and not really explain that. And, uh, but, of course, it's all explained in full in the Old Testament. So to get the fullness of what God is saying and what Jesus came to fulfill, you, you have to know the Old Testament. Of course, we're not under the Old Covenant now, but now even understanding and studying the Old Covenant brings much light on, on the New Covenant that we're under now. So, yes, it's, um, it's all God's Word. Praise mm. God. <laughs> and of course, Jesus loved the Old Testament. He... He endorsed the Old Testament. And the Bible says all scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for, for us. And that certainly includes the Old Testament. It's very profitable for us. Mm. Uh, there's something like uh, over 300 prophecies that were fulfilled in and through the life and death of Jesus Christ. So they were prophesied in what we call the Old Testament. Uh, and you would need to know what they are just uh, to benefit from seeing the fulfillment of those played out in, in and through his life. Yeah, I mean, Jesus is everywhere in the Old Testament. You've, you've got the Messianic prophecies, you've got the types and shadows, and, and, you, and also you have appearances called um, theophanies, where whether as the angel of the Lord or the commander of the army of the, the Lord or in different promise. roles, that is, when, that is Jesus mm. who is appearing. And so uh, that's why Jesus could say when he gave his Bible study or when he rose from the dead, he's, he say, Don't, you know, you ought to believe everything that was being said about me from the beginning to the end of the Old Testament. Jesus is the central subject. Mm. And do you remember, of course, when he said, uh, Father, glorify me alongside you as I was before the world was. Mm. 
yeah. showing that he had a he pre-existed his, his time when he was on the earth uh, some people would probably not have grasped that yeah i mean he's uh, that's how the foundational gospel begins isn't it in john that in the beginning mm -hmm. was the word and the word was with god and the word was god and then the word became flesh i mean even when it says god gave his son to us you know that means that the son existed from before mm -hmm. time and then god gave him to us to become a man and you know we that's the only way we can be saved is because he's the god man because he's god he he represents God, he connects us to God, and because he's man, he can lay his hand on us too, and he can bring God and man together in himself. And so uh, it's essential to believe that he is both God and man. He's not just Jesus, which is the name of his humanity, but he is the Lord Jesus. That means his deity and his humanity combined in one person. Mm -hmm. And again, just to throw another bit of scripture at that uh, reference of Jesus being before the world was, was uh, when he was talking to the Pharisees and the scribes there, they're always trying to catch him out with questions. And he said, uh, look, I was before Abraham was. And they said, they were sort of like up in arms about it. They did, just couldn't see it, could they, who he was? He said, before really. Abraham was, I am. Yeah, there, even better, the I am. I am. Yeah. Yes, and when they were about to arrest him, because I've just been studying this in the Garden of Gethsemane, you know, really to prove the fact that he wasn't, he, get, he was giving his own life. He could have easily escaped them. He could have called down angels. And uh, could be up to 500 to 1,000 people actually came to arrest him. It was a Roman cohort, plus all the others, come to find him in the garden because they knew he was powerful. <laughs> you know, mm. Every time they tried to get him before, they failed somehow. And... Uh, and as he came out of the cave there, he, he said, who are you looking for? Jesus of Nazareth. And again, he just said, I am. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then that, th that, th that, th that thousand people suddenly f were slain in the spirit. They fell down as dead. Mm. And, now, the uh, significance of that, let me just say, uh, I, unless I was dreaming or uh, uh, in, in, in another part of the world, when I watched the funeral, which I thought, by the way, of Margaret, Thatcher's funeral was absolutely incredible, very moving. Um, but I think it was the Bishop of London who, in his address, s mentioned the I am in Jesus being so important. And now, for our viewers who don't understand what we're saying, wh what is the significance between the expression I am and Jesus Christ? Well, I am is the name of God. You know, when he, he says, my name, I am that I am or uh, I am for short. In other words, he's the eternal one. He isn't someone who is, who is becoming like we are. He just is. He's the unchangeable, un eternal I am. So it's a name that only God has. So on a number of occasions, Jesus declared he was the I am. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's translated as I am he, but the he is in italics. It shouldn't be translated. It's, he's declaring he's the I am. And of course, every time he said something like, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, the life. These are claims of deity. You know, and no, no mere man can, can say those things. Mm -hmm. um, How does so, that tie in with Tetragrammaton for the name uh, YHWH for the Yahweh? Yes, that, it's re very closely related. The I am is like a shortened form, really. Because um, sometimes Yahweh would be shortened to Yah. <laughs> so Yahweh... Um, is I am that I am, essentially. Exactly. Brilliant. By the way, I, I don't know if it's I discovered it or either I read it a long time ago and it suddenly came to me. I'm not sure. But, you know, the, the, the Yahweh is a wonderful picture of the Trinity. Because the first, the, the first, it's, it's the Trinity there, you see. Because there are four letters, right? But there are actually three letters because the, the H, huh, yeah, so it's the Yod first, Mm -hmm. Which is why? Yep. It reads right to left. So um, uh, the yod is represents the father because that's the hand actually. It's the it's the hand that that is the the originator of all things. And then the h the h is the letter of the Holy Spirit. It's the breath word. <sighs> you see. Um, so for example, when God changed Abraham to Abraham, 
He did it by breathing his breath into the middle of Abraham's name. That's what he does to us when we're born again. He breathes and we become a changed person. And Sarai became Sarah, you see. So the H represents the Holy Spirit. So it's, you know, Y, H, and then the other one is, is the W or the V, which was, the, was, was, again, the word for a nail or that which connects two things together. Well, that's, again, a picture of the Son of Christ who connects heaven and earth, who cor corrects God and man. And, the, and it shows, the, the name shows the procession of the Holy Spirit because the Spirit flows from the Father through the Son. You see, and so you see the H in two places. That's a picture of the dynamic motion of the Holy Spirit flowing from the Father, first of all between the Father and the Son, but also flowing through the Son. So um, if, if you write that out, you might see that. But it's it, it's actually a beautiful picture of the relationships within the Trinity. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Um, emails are starting to come in, but I did ask you, and as I've asked the question, we shall continue, as they say on some of these famous programs, the <laughs> keys of time, and then I'll start to uh, read your emails, which are coming sure. in very nicely. Thank you very much. Uh, keys of time, n the new book, uh, outline it. Thank you. Shall I hold it up? Is See. Any, any help? A little higher. Thank you. The, um, I've been laboring on this uh, the last few months. Um, I'm very pleased that it's it's finished now. It's my, um, you see, when I beca became a Christian, I was actually at university studying mathematics. And then becoming a Christian changed everything. And I suddenly changed from being just interested in maths, really, to being interested in everything, because the Bible involves every area. But I always wanted to use my maths in related to the Bible. And... And so when I discovered, in fact, the Bible is full of numbers, <laughs> full of chronology in particular, because God writes good history, and you can't have good history without timings. Um, and so I started to make that a special study, the, the chronology of the Bible. And Excellent. I've been amazed, over, and that's 30 years, you know, I've been amazed over the years just to see how mathematically consistent it all is, how it fits together wonderfully. And uh, once you understand the keys, I call it the keys of time, because there are certain keys that God reveals without which... See, the Bible's a spiritual book. Huh? You, can, you couldn't just read it and understand it just with your intellect alone. You, you have to be helped by the Holy Spirit. And once you understand the keys of time, which are certain revelations as to how God orders time and controls the course of time, um, then the whole thing fits together. It's almost like when you know the architect's plan, then uh, all the bricks and all the different materials fi find their right place, and you see the glory of God. And so um, this book really, it's quite a long book, about 300 pages, but it kind of explains the keys of time. And then we go through, right starting from Adam all the way through, to Christ, showing how all the chronological information fits together perfectly, and uh, we're able to date all the events in the Bible and everything. So it's a book that's very close to my heart, among all the books, but uh, it's, it's my foundational book, I suppose, on Bible chronology. I mean, I've written special books on the times of the Gentiles and Daniel 70 weeks, but this, this is the book, really, on, on Bible chronology. So. <laughs> Well, it's that's a, going to be extremely useful to uh, mm -hmm. uh, many Bible students, if they're Christians who are really serious about understanding uh, Bible chronology. Uh, could you give us, because I'm interested as well, I'd like to get a copy of the book, is that give us some of the key points, so, uh, like stepping stones, as it were, from Adam to Christ, uh, you know, without getting into the 300 pages. Yeah, well, quite, that's the problem. Yeah. But um, <laughs> can I mention a phone number? in case anyone's interested. Sure, or do you so, have a website? If I mention my website, then you, the phone number's on there. Right. Um, Oxfordbiblechurch.co.uk Okay, it's on, the, it's on the, there on the screen at the moment, oxfordbiblechurch.co.uk, and you'll get the telephone number uh, if you want to find out more about this particular book. Uh, really, but this is probably the one... Just share the first two keys. Mm -hmm. uh, easily, um, and that is the fact that God has a structure for time. He's not making it up as he goes along. He, he, he does have a plan of time, and it's actually the creation week. 
this isn't a new idea, by the way. This was known by the Jewish rabbis, by the early church, although it's not talked about so much now. But creation week is the picture of time. You've got the six days and then the day of rest. God's day, as it were. <laughs> and this is a picture, and then in Psalm 90 and 2 Peter 3 confirms it. And he was confirming what was a well-known idea at the time. Um, he was saying, you know, the Lord isn't slow concerning his return, but let not this one fact escape your, your, your notice, that one day with the Lord is as a thousand years. And I believe this was a typological key that he was giving to understand that God has a time blueprint, a time structure that he's working by, and this is a hint that there would be 6,000 years of man, and then there would be this 1,000 years of rest. And then, of course, the Apostle John in the book of Revelation confirmed that when he said the, 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 um, when Christ returns, he will reign not for 100 years, not for 3,000 years, but exactly 1,000 years. Mm -hmm. Now, especially the people at the time would have understood that he was endorsing this idea because that's exactly what we'd expect, that there was a day of rest. How long? A thousand years of rest. The earth will stop its striving under the curse, and under Jesus it will enter the rest. You see, Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath, and so he will be the Lord over the earth on that day. And so we have these 6,000 years and then a 1,000 years, and uh, there's many kind of, I go through, you know, 50 to 100 pages showing uh, all the different confirmations of this in the Bible, which are wonderful. For example, the Passover lamb was set aside four days before it sacrificed on the 14th. This is a picture of Christ set aside to be sacrificed from the foundation of the world. Four days, that is 4,000 years later, he was offered up. Why did Jesus weep at Lazarus's tomb? Why did he wait four days? Well, let me suggest one explanation, because he was doing something more than just raising Lazarus. He was announcing, he chose this to announce, I am the resurrection and the life. In other words, what he's saying is, what I did for Lazarus, I am doing and I will do for all humanity. Why did he wait four days? Because Lazarus represents all mankind who has been under spiritual death and physical death for 4,000 years. And so Jesus came along at the end of those 4,000 years and he raised Lazarus from the dead as a sign of what he was going to do in, through his death and resurrection, that he will raise us all up. And if we've received him, where our spirit has already been raised from the dead, and one day our body will, will follow along. And, uh, and then what it also means is, and by the way, what, I think one reason this idea has fallen out of favor is because, you know, everyone thought, well, the millennium, you know, two, year 2000, that if this is true, then that w the end would have been then kind of thing. And, um, and so obviously nothing happened in year 2000. But what people don't realize is that it, uh, they always just measured from his birth. But the, it doesn't, the turning point is his death. The 4,000 years ends with his death and resurrection. And so the next two days, which is the church age, it's a hint, really, that the church age should be about 2,000 years. And so that didn't start with his birth. It started with his death. So we're looking at 2033, approximately. Kind of thing. You know, I'm not, yeah. I'm not making predictions yeah, here. Yeah, I understand. But if this structure is valid then that's the kind of thing we're looking at. Um, in, in, you know, if, you know, it's typology, so we don't know that we know, but, um, you know, that the structure does point to the fact that we are getting within, you know, let's say the last 20 years, which um, I feel is quite realistic. <laughs> that's, that's, of course, confirmed by the rise of Israel mm. as the fig tree. But um, then, of course, the seventh day begins when Christ returns. He will reign for a thousand years. And there's a wonderful pro confirmation of this in Hosea chapter 5 and 6 where it talks about the Messiah coming to Israel, but Israel reject him. He goes away to heaven. He says, and I will go back and I'll return to my place until, until Israel repent. And then it describes Israel repenting. And Israel say, after two days, he will raise us up again. And on the third day, we will live in his sight. And so this is a hint that Israel, as it were, will be 
out of fellowship for two days. But at the end of the two days, they will repent and Jesus will raise her up again. And they will live in his sight for the third day. That, that's the millennium. And so there are many more of these that if we had time I could go through, but you'll just have to get the book, I guess. <laughs> Very smart guy. Now, uh, just so that the viewers out there uh, can really get on to asking some questions about this, this is an interesting topic. It's something which I, I sits well with me. I've read those uh, same scriptures, and particularly in Peter, where it talks about uh, the timing here of a thousand years for a day in God's sight and the 6,000 year and then the final uh, period of a thousand years which is only a day in God's sight for uh, Christ or the millennial yeah. rule but you know one of the other things uh, Derek which is worth mentioning when uh, Lazarus was raised you know Jesus actually did say look th guys you wonder at this this is nothing he said the day will come when all those in the memorial tombs in the graves mm. will rise yeah. Uh, you know, so indicating that this is just one resurrection, but the was, resurrection of all uh, will take place one day. Yeah. All so, of Jesus' miracles were signs demonstrating what he will do on a large scale. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Uh, Alex, can't read you all that because it's uh, creation one at the moment. Uh, we're talking about eschatology tonight. Um, I'm now 60 years and I've lived through the Thatcher years and has uh, recently... And as a recently born again Christian, it has really upset me that I cannot find a kind word for her. How does one deal with people that are deliberately callous towards a suffering of others? I feel a real failure. Please help, James. Well, James, you know, uh, it's not an eschatological question, but I, I do think, you know, you, as Christians, uh, we do need to forgive if you, that's something that will get you onto the right standing with God because you know if we can't forgive others God's not going to forgive us that's in the Lord's prayer for a start off but you know the thing is that no matter what um, you think Margaret Thatcher did or didn't do that there are there are sides to Margaret Thatcher that only those close to her actually uh, was able to witness and there was a lot of kindness there that she demonstrated to little people as well I said it the other day, but I'll say it again just for you, James. She went up to a waitress uh, to comfort her because she spilled hot soup over um, a very uh, important guest at a dinner date. And she wasn't so much worried about the, the guest, but more how that uh, lady was feeling, who was the waitress. Things like that that you don't know about and paying people's bills um, because they couldn't afford the, the poll tax or whatever, is that there are two sides, and I think... It's good, first of all, for your own good, that you actually uh, just forgive her and uh, you'll find uh, it a, a lot better. It will go well with your soul. Anything you'd like to add to that? Well, no, it wasn't an eschatology. Yes, I, mean, well, I agree completely with what you say. We, we, we must avoid judgment. Jesus said, judge not lest you be judged. And um, I know I speak as a pastor, but... Um, I think particularly when you're dealing with those who are in authority, it's not, uh, as it says, as an example, you know, honor father and mother, that it might go well with you. Mm. Um, if, and, and often those in authority do fail, but often we don't understand what they're facing. You know, often we see the, our narrow situation, you know, that maybe we've suffered for maybe a decision's been made that we don't like, and yet we're not really in a position to know what the one in authority has many other considerations they've got to take into account. And often you're faced with decisions that you, you will not be able to keep everyone happy. You've got to make a decision and, you know, you actually have more information than probably others who just see it from their point of view. And so mm -hmm. it's not safe really to judge those in authority because you don't have all the facts of, of the whole situation necessarily. You're just feeling it from your point of view. And so... We should pray for those who are in authority, even if we don't agree with them. If we judge them, then we actually will reap judgment mm -hmm. in our own life. You know, we'll reap. You know, it won't go well for us as it ought to. Mm -hmm. And um, and so it, it just, you know, I know what it's like sometimes I make decisions as a pastor, and it's not possible for me to explain, you know, all the factors of the situation because there's confidentialities and things like that and so there has to be a certain amount of trust um, 
and there has to be, you know, you have to give people a lot of slack because we have to leave the final judgment to the Lord. Mm -hmm. And as a, a believer, um, you, James, you have to <coughs> say, as the Lord leads us to, is that, you know, if we say we love God and hate our brother uh, whom we can see and we, we're saying we love God whom we can't see, it, it, it's, it's, it's not compatible. Um, and according to what uh, we know about Margaret Thatcher is that she was a believer in God, in Jesus Christ. Uh, and so you got to forgive her. Hi, folks. So glad we have teachers like you. That's for, um, for Derek here. Just over a year ago, our daughter-in-law gave birth to our granddaughter. Unfortunately, our granddaughter died and she was less than an hour old. Uh, in years to come, when we meet her again, will she still be a baby or will she have grown? God bless you uh, both, Dave in Charlesbury, Charlbury. That's very sad. Sorry about to hear that. But you, the good thing is we do have hope for the future. What's your take on uh, timing of people growing uh, in yeah, I mean, heaven? I can only use my logic, and I would say yes. Um, they will have grown, normally speaking, that there is a parallel timing in heaven as on earth, uh, you know, in because even the third heaven is a created realm. It's a created heaven. And they do experience time. You know, even in the New Jerusalem, it talks about the tree of life bringing fruit, forth fruit, you know, each month, you know. And so there is a process <laughs> of time. And so, yeah, I think uh, they will have grown up. Um in, there's a parallel timing between heaven and earth. Mm. I think they'll let, uh, get to an age of maturity and, and because we won't be growing old and getting sick and die, uh, there will be a, a, an age of uh, a young person like maybe 21, maybe, uh, you know, whatever it is. It's not going to be a babe and it's not going to get to be a, an old person in oh, that man. sense. <laughs> yeah. um, hi, guys. Love the show. My question is, how come the genealogy in Matthew and Luke are different? Asks Stuart. Good question. Yeah, there's a good answer, though. Well, um, one of one of the genealogies is traced through Mary, and one is through Joseph. Is the is the quick answer to that? Um, in Matthew, if I've got this right, it it actually traces Joseph's genealogy, and in Luke, it which is from Mary's point of view, uh, which traces his humanity from Adam. It's actually um, uh, the genealogy through Mary. So, I mean, you, because of the nature of genealogies, I, I, you know, if you had your genealogy done, depending on how you trace the line, you, you could have m many genealogies, you know, depending on which grandfather you exactly, chose. Exactly, yeah. You know. So it's not a surprise that there are different genealogies. But yeah. God gave the two different genealogies. In fact, there are, there are four genealogies through the four Gospels, in a, in a sense. Matthew is the Gospel that talks about Jesus as the king. And so it gives the genealogy through the kingly line and then through Joseph. Um, and then um, Luke represents his humanity, which is through Mary. And then Mark is Jesus as the servant. And a servant does not have a genealogy. That's uh, irrelevant for a servant. And then John gives the divine genealogy. You know, in his origin is, is heaven. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and then the Word became flesh. So each gospel gives, gives a different camera angle on Jesus. Mm -hmm. Very good. Uh, worth mentioning here, that in connection with your book as well, uh, The Keys of Time, <clears throat> is that the genealogies in the Bible, are uh, we accept they might... Uh, not be totally complete, but they certainly uh, pinpoint a time of around about 6,000 years, do they not, from today? Well, the, the chronology is complete because uh, the way it's done is that there's no room for gaps because it says so-and-so was uh, 300 years old and gave birth to so-and-so, you know. So there, there's, there's no, there's, you know, you can work out the dates exactly. Mm -hmm. Just one other question, because it came in a bit late the other day uh, for Dr. Grady, so I couldn't bring it up. But the question was with regards to the timing of uh, the 6,000 years, or looking, so let's go back, sorry, let's just go forward to the flood. From the time of the flood till today, 
he couldn't understand why we would be at seven, approximately seven billion people, and he didn't think that was feasible from eight people. But you're a mathematician. That, that, that's no problem at all. That's what the I amazing thought. Thing is, it wasn't more, you know, because in fact, until a hundred years ago or so, you know, the populations were very low, you know, well under a billion. It's only in the last hundred years that we've exploded up to what is it now, seven or eight billion? Mm -hmm. So that shows you the multiplication of growth that can easily happen. You know, um, if you do the mathematics, it's not a problem at all. Um, it's actually amazing that the population levels stayed, you know, below, um, well, well below a billion until, you know, relatively recently. Mm -hmm. So, uh, no, it's not actually a problem. Thank you for answering that. Uh, this, uh, before the foundation of the world, was Jesus a separate being from the Heavenly Father? Uh, no, you have to be careful with this, with the language here. Father, Son and Holy Spirit are one being. There is one God. But this one God exists in three persons. So he's not a separate being, no. Mm -hmm. uh, but he's separate, a separate personality, you might say. Dear uh, Howard and Derek, since with the father. Right, thanks. Uh, in Isaiah sixty-five twenty, it says the child shall die a hundred year old. Uh, this is uh, part of the new creation. I didn't think that people died in the new creation. Do you have any thoughts on this? Says Darren. There is um, in the millennium, death is rare, and the curse is removed from the earth, and people are able to live. The full, you know, God originally intended man not to die after a hundred or whatever, but. To, to live on. Um, it was the curse, and so when Jesus is present, he pushes the curse back. It's effectively removed. But there is death, there is, for example, capital punishment. Now, basically, it's saying if someone dies at 100 years old, they will be as a child, you know, um, because the, the cycle of life will be completely different. But there, will, there is uh, capital punishment, for sure, that those who... Um, um, Commit if they commit um, some terrible thing, they, they, there is capital punishment, and so believers won't die, but there will be some unbelievers who who die during the millennium. Well said. Uh, David writes in. He says, uh, "What is true repentance? Uh, is it turning to Jesus, or is it asking for forgiveness each time we sin?" He says, "I follow Jesus and sin a whole lot less uh, than I used to do." but still struggle at times. Does Jesus' blood cover my past, present and future sins and give me salvation as I'm saved in the spirit, but still a sinner in the flesh? David. So the first part of the question there, uh, it really is repenting. It's not just turning to Jesus because there are people who turn to Jesus and Jesus says, I don't know you, get away from me, you workers of iniquity. Gosh, there's a lot of questions in there at the same time. Yeah, I was throwing those last ones in, sorry. But, um, there's the repentance that comes with salvation. But also, in our life, there's an ongoing repentance. You know, we need to distinguish our, our salvation from our Christian life. Our salvation is by God's grace. Uh, but we receive that grace by putting our trust in Jesus. But that involves repenting from trusting in ourselves, you know. Um, going our own way, trusting in ourselves, being our own God. We, we make a fundamental repentance there. Um, now, uh, and, we, and the key thing is that we're putting our trust in Christ alone, and that's how you're saved. While you're still trusting in your works, your performance, or whatever, you're still not saved because you haven't put your whole trust in Christ. Um, and that's the danger of cults, is that they will normally teach you a combination of faith and works to be saved or faith plus affiliation to their church or something like that. Whereas the yeah, salvation is by grace through faith alone. But, um, and so there is an, in, a repentance involved in salvation. Now, in terms of being free from all our sins, you know, that happens as a process of time. That's sanctification that takes place. As we walk with Christ, as we take hold of his power, we're able to overcome sin more and more. But that, that's a process of growth. And so to answer another angle of the question, you know, if we sin, then we should confess it to God. 
Um, but I think what we would think of as real repentance in a sin is when we actually are able to look at that sin and see what, how it hurts God, how it hurts other people, and we come to a point where we hate that sin. It's not like we secretly love that sin, but we, we see it in its full light. We see it as it is, like a cancerous tumor on our life that's sucking the life out of us, that's destroying us. We take a good hard look at that sin, and by the grace of God, we hate that sin. And we turn from it, and we make a decision, you know, that we, we won't touch that. And that, in a sense, that, that is the kind of repentance that will lead to, you know, getting free from that sin. But when we accept Christ, we have the remission of sins. In, in, in the sense of our position before God, our sins are wiped clean. Past, present, future, we are justified. We stand righteous before God by the grace of God. But in our fellowship with God, it is affected if we sin. And if we, if we sin, if we're selfish, that cuts us off from the life of God. And we need to make that right with God. Because um, we have to agree. How can we walk with God unless the two are, are agreed? We, and sometimes we have to say, God, I'm sorry. You know, <laughs> that, was, that was wrong. We have to judge that sin. And, uh, and that allows God to cleanse us from it so that we can walk with him more. But we're not earning our salvation in that because salvation is a done deal. It's a gift. It's a free gift of grace. Yeah. So how would you advise then on the scripture in Hebrews 10.26? I agree with what you said, but just Hebrews 10.26. Yes. Yeah. Well, it always comes around to this in a way. <laughs> Um, I think we're talking about losing your salvation. Not even talking about that. Even even um, if you just read the scripture. Remind me what ten, Hebrews ten twenty six is. For if we go on sinning willfully after having received the knowledge of the truth, mm. there's no longer remains a sacrifice for our sins, but a terrifying expectation of judgment. Yeah, and so what what I will teach from that is our salvation is secure. It's given to us by Christ. Like, I might give you a gift, but you might choose, you know, I might give you the keys of time book, but you might decide uh, foolishly to throw it in the bin and say, I want none of that stuff. And God will, I believe, if someone makes a cold-hearted decision, because they continue in sinning, because they keep hardening their heart, oh, and they embrace a lifestyle of sin, they are, there is a danger that they will cross a line that they will um, so harden their heart that they will reject Christ. He's not rejecting them, but they will reject Christ. Hmm. And if that happens, then, you know, I think Hebrews is warning of the danger of that, that uh, if you reject your salvation, if you reject Christ, then God has nothing else to, to save you with. Hmm. Uh, and that's borne out uh, pretty much in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 5, and so on. It says... Yeah. Uh, and having tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, and then having fallen away, it is impossible to renew them again to repentance, since they again crucify to themselves the Son of God and put him to, him to shame. There's a verse also in 1 Corinthians 11, where Paul actually talks about God does discipline us um, sometimes in this life. And he says the reason for that is that we would not be judged along with the world. Well, the world will be judged. We know what will happen there, ultimately, with hell. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so he says that actually if we start moving into a lifestyle of sin, God will move to discipline us because his, he, wants to, he wants to stop us crossing that line, you know, yeah. where we'll be judged along with the world. But the great thing is, I think, it's, uh, what David has experienced so mm. far. He says, you know, it's getting better. Um, he's yeah. sinning less. And exactly. I think that's the, that's a, you know, sorry. what happens certainly to me, it's happened to me, uh, that, and we can repent of the sin and that become, as you said, I like that, we actually come to hate the sin that we do. Um, mm. And therefore, ev eventually, we get the mastery over it. Um, yes. And I think just to encourage David, that we have, uh, by the power and grace of God, uh, to overcome these things that beset us in sin. But, you know, it's, it's a wonderful thing that we have See, a high priest there that we can confess our sins to. You could always ask God to show him, Lord, show me, let me see this sin as you see it. 
Mm-hmm. Um, Very brave question. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Howard, uh, Pastor Derek, can you explain why uh, it is important for Christians to bless and support Israel and the Jews, even though they don't believe that Jesus is the only way to the Father? Ask Tony. To bless Israel well, well, and the Jews, why is it so important? It's like every nation. Um, there are an increasing number of believers uh, in Israel uh, around the world, maybe a million, I heard someone say, who do now believe in Jesus, praise God. But yes, we bless them uh, part, mo- because God commanded us to. Mm-hmm. And, um, of course, the f- famous verse in Genesis 12 that, that those who bless Abraham and his seed will be blessed, and those who curse him will be cursed. And so we're commanded to bless Israel um, because we, we need to align ourselves with God's plan. And, and really, when you pray for them to be saved, to, to see Jesus, you're blessing them, aren't you? You're releasing God's blessing in their lives. How are they ultimately going to be blessed is, is by the, God revealing the Messiah to them. So pray that, that God will open their eyes, to, and that more and more of them are doing that. So we, we also bless, I, you know, I would say also the nation of Israel which is more controversial, as well as individual Jews, because I believe that that is part of God's plan. God prophesied it, that though he would scatter them to the nations, he would regather them again. And so God, it's God who's regathered Israel and made her a nation again. This is one of the important things for the end times. And so, you know, this uh, is, they, they may not be perfect, but we need to pray for them, we need to bless them. Um, because this is part of what God is doing, you know. And it, uh, if we think about it in the, your time, book of time, and understanding those key points, I think yeah, Israel figures so strongly in the chronological um, will of God, as it were, chronologically made clear in Scripture. For example, uh, that the, the fact that the Jews were the chosen ones in which we today have the benefit of the Bible. Uh, and it is something which they've kept the oracles of God for us meticulously. Um, the prophets uh, of old uh, have so much value to us today. Um, and the, it's a covenant. It's, the thing is, it's not the fact that Israel is a special people in the world, terms of the world. They are to God because he chose them to be a vessel for his salvation. And in and through them, uh, the Gentiles are do have salvation through Jesus Christ. It is, and, well, it, the, you know, and Jesus it w- was, was a Jew. They gave us Jesus. Exactly. He yeah. still is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Mm-hmm. So he's, he's not, he still is Jewish. Um, and, <laughs> and they suffered. He's the king of Israel. And the Jews suffered incredibly, not just at the time of the Holocaust, but in the times prior to that, all the way from the, almost the beginning of time, God's people suffered and I think it's only right that God has honoured them, even though they made mistakes. Like any heaven, uh, loving father, he would rebuke his children and then uh, put his loving arms around them. And uh, this is the covenant he made with them, to restore them to where they are today um, and to be you know, such a blessed people, although they're still suffering. Um, but anyway, it's a long, uh, there's a lot more to this particular point, which we haven't got time to well, go into God tonight. says that they are the apple of his eye. You know, that is referring to Israel, first of all. And uh, so God loves Israel. And if we say that we have the love of God in our heart, then there will be a love for his people, Israel, in our heart too. Yeah, read Romans uh, 9, 10, 11. Uh, we, in, in one sense, we shouldn't have to be told to love Israel. It should be in us mm-hmm. if we're born again. Very good point. Dear friends, uh, is physical healing part of the atonement? An elder in the church maintains that if you go into the original Hebrew and Greek, it clearly shows that by his stripes we are healed, is only referring to sin. Please, can you clear this matter up for me, Margaret? No, I'm I'm a firm believer that that healing is in the atonement. Every spiritual, every blessing is purchased on the cross, you know. you can't divorce the cross from anything. And um, I think the case for healing in the atonement is very strong. Um, it says that Christ became a curse for us. Now, the curse includes sickness. If you read what the definition of the curse in the Bible. Well, it's death, so isn't it, it, itself? Sickness, death. 
Um, and so Jesus took that for us on the cross. He took the curse. He didn't just take sin. He took the consequences of sin, which is the curse, which mm -hmm. is death. Mm -hmm. And, and sick, sickness is incipient death. Um, Isaiah 53 proves it because the actual words there, um, he bore our sicknesses and carried our pains. That's the literal translation. And the proof of that is that when the Holy Spirit quotes that in Matthew 8, 16 and 17, he quotes from Isaiah 53 and he says, Jesus just had a healing service and he just healed everyone who came to him that it might be fulfilled what was spoken by Isaiah the prophet himself bore our sicknesses and carried our pains. And in the Greek, there is no question that that is talking about physical sicknesses. So the Holy Spirit's only interpretation of Isaiah 53 is that, you know, um, it's... It's talking about physical sicknesses and pains. And so the King James translators to, you know, avoided the issue by translating it, he bore our griefs and our sorrows. But actually it's sicknesses and pains, had they been consistent. By his stripes we're healed. Well, there's, there's no way you can argue from the Hebrew that that excludes physical healing. No way. Even if you argue that you can widen the word to include other things, you know, that... I think they would say, oh, it heals our relationship with God or something. Well, that's a spiritual application of the word. But the word itself is by his stripes we're healed, by his physical stripes, by his physical bruise we're healed. That would be the literal interpretation. So that, that's a false statement, actually. And, um, and, and, and then it says, and the chastisement for our peace, that's our shalom, was upon him. Now, shalom in the Bible is wholeness. It re represents wholeness in every area of your life, including physical, you know, when you say shalom, peace, you're not just saying, oh, have mental peace. You're saying, may your life be full, may, may you not be lacking in anything. And that certainly mean, includes, may you be in health. And so Isaiah 53 absolutely demonstrates healings in the atonement. Because Jesus had to pay for, for, for everything, didn't he? And, uh, and so... Praise God, by his stripes we were healed. Thank Healing you, is made available to us. Praise oh, God. Good answer for Margaret there. Thank you. Um, next question. Greetings, uh, Pastor Walker. What is your view on the Roman baptism? Is it valid? Asks Paul. The what, sorry? The Roman baptism. Are we talking probably the Catholic Church or... or if you're baptised in the Catholic Church. Or le I'm just, I'm, I'm guessing there. I'm making it, or no. is it uh, infant baptism? Maybe you can deal do, with both yeah. of those. Yes, if we talk about... No, um, I always say this, um, uh, that um, if you were, had something done to you when you were an infant, infant, that's good. It's a good thing. You know, um, I was christened in the Anglican Church by my parents. And, you know, that's a good thing. I don't know how much they understood what they were doing, but they were, in their own way, dedicating me to God. Jesus was dedicated to God in the temple as a baby, and that's fine. But it's not what the Bible means by baptism. In the Bible, in, in the Bible baptism is, first of all, by immersion. It must by, be a, by immersion, full immersion in water, because that's the definition of the word baptism. And secondly, you, you believe first. You must believe, and then you're baptized. And that's consistent in, in, in the Bible. So whatever was done to you as a baby, it may be a good thing, but it's not baptism. Uh, unfortunately, we've inherited this thing from church history, from the Catholic Church, and then uh, even the Protestant denominations, picked up on that same error but the bible is clear enough that you believe and then you're baptized jesus was baptized as our example when he was 30 he was um he was not a baby and uh, everyone baptized in the new testament that we know was old enough to to make it their own testimony of faith exactly uh thank you so much derek um, the Keys of Time, the book that Derek's written, uh, Cynthia is writing in here and said uh, the book is brilliant um, and also she was saying I see I am as God is ever present, not I was or will be, he is present and, uh, and we will understand when we go home to heaven, we will be in constant uh, presence or his presence, blessings to you, the book is brilliant, that was uh, Thank you. Cynthia. Uh, please 
do reply to my text. Well, let me read it. I was browsing the internet searching for teachings on God. I came across a blog that claimed we're all living in a computer and this life and world is just a computer illusion. I thought it's stupid at first, but now I, can, I can't seem to get it out of my mind at all, asked John. Yeah, uh, people's understanding of life uh, does start to think in terms of um, maybe we're just a pawn uh, in some game or some, somebody else's backyard or imagination. Uh, but the reality is there is a purpose behind us all and I'm sure Pastor Derek will fill in all the scriptures. Well, all I would say is I, this quote comes to mind, you know, when people stop believing in God, they'll start believing in anything. And, of course, for Christians, these, you know, if you're, if you're not a believer, then, of course, you can come up with all these philosophical speculations. Um, but we believe in a God who is true. So he doesn't deceive us. This world that we're in is real, um, and he is truth. So he doesn't deceive us. We're not living in some kind of imaginary matrix world, you know, because um, God is truth, and he is true, and he doesn't lie. So as Christians, these, these issues are settled for us. Unbelievers, of course, yes, of course, they, they are afloat on a... Uh, on a sea of not knowing anything really and so they might latch on to any kind of strange idea mm -hmm. uh, that's why it's really good to read the bible for me it makes it very clear that we're uh, made for with a purpose and for for a reason and god has uh, a wonderful future for us uh, it may not be on this earth uh, there's a new heaven and new earth, Revelation 21. We've only got to come. Yeah, we've only got three minutes. The mark of the beast is obviously going to be a microchip or some uh, similar technology. Could a Christian accidentally take it, or will the spirit show? Uh, well, sh I can't make that out. Uh, what you're saying there, but basically, uh, can we accidentally take the mark as a believer? Yes or no, and why? And well, how? I don't believe that. We'll be around for that, I believe, in the pre-tribulation rapture. But uh, there will be believers at that time. But they, it does say that if you take the mark of the beast, presumably it's got to be on purpose because the mark of the beast is not just some chip. It's you, you take it along with a vow of allegiance. There of you go, the exactly. So you can't take it accidentally. It's a decision that you make to reject God and make Antichrist your God. That's how it will actually play out. Uh, very small writing here. I'll try and get it in before the end. Uh, do all the Jews need to return to Israel before the second coming of Christ, asks Howard Reed. No, I don't think that will happen. The Bible predicts the regathering of Israel what happens in two stages. The first stage is what's happened and is happening, which is a partial regathering in unbelief. And then when the Messiah returns, um, there will be a complete and total regathering in faith. It says when the Messiah returns, he will whistle and he will gather the elect from the four corners of the earth. He will complete the regathering of Israel so that in the millennium, uh, all Israel will be in the land. But no, the, it won't be complete until the second coming. Uh, going to get this one in. Larry in Ireland says, can Pastor Walker, as a mathematician, please explain why, if God is perfection, there is an incompleteness theorem? Because perfection is only found in God, not within any mathematical structure. So people won't understand Gödel's theorem, but um, basically it's consistent with what we believe because perfection cannot be found within this creation. Perfection is only found in the com creator. So this creation do cannot stand alone apart from God. It's, you know, only God, only in God do you find perfection. So it's absolutely compatible with a with creator. Okay. Uh, thank you, Pastor Derek. And the book again, if you want to get it, The Keys of Keys Time. Keys of Time. Yeah. So uh, we're out of time, and I'm sorry that uh, can't get to all the other emails. What we're going to do is uh, try and post these on to our Facebook. Uh, there's the information on your screen, and, we'll, and then the Church Without Walls can pick up their responsibility and give, it, give an answer as best you can. Help each other. Thank you so much. Night-night.